the 100th anniversary of the start of the First World War. But with no veterans still living, is it now OK to call places like this a tourist attraction? Coming up on this week's show, we visit the battlefields of Belgium to ask if there's a fine line between commemoration and cashing in. We visit a mysterious underwater world off the coast of Mexico. We head to Rome to find out why any time is espresso time in Italy. This is really special. And we go backstage at the first ever German production of box office smash, War Horse, in Berlin. Looking at the grand cathedral spires and Renaissance-style squares of Ypres in Belgium, you would never know that this town was razed to the ground during the First World War. Today, it has become a major center for war tourism. In July this year, the world will commemorate the 100th anniversary of the beginning of the war. And this place is busy preparing for its time in the spotlight. The town of Ypres will be a hive of activity throughout this commemorative year. And they're expecting to receive around half a million visitors with an influx of tourists that big for local businesses. That means a huge opportunity. The First World War raged across Europe and the world from 1914 to 1918. Both the German and Allied forces dug in and fought a slow-moving, brutal war from frontline trenches. Flanders saw some of the heaviest fighting during the war and millions lost their lives here. This is part of a trench system that stretched all the way from here in Belgium down to the Swiss border. So this is a, a German trench built in 1917. Uh, it's German because, for instance, of the wattle work and also the... Archaeologist Mark de Wilde has been involved in the excavation of trenches in the region, some of which are now open to tourists. Archaeology brings daily life in the trenches much more than, for instance, in the written uh, material. So with all the finds we have, we really can imagine how they lived. A pretty grim reality, I imagine. Yes. If you see the, the damage done to the trenches by uh, shelling, and if you imagine that there's soldiers standing over there, so you almost experience how life was in, in these trenches. Is there a danger, do you think, that it could become over-commercialised, this event? There's always a, a danger, I think. It's, it's all about remembrance and so on, respect for the, the soldiers who died. Uh, this should be the focus uh, of this, this centennial. Most tourists coming to this region are looking to the past, but in Ypres, the focus is very much on the present and the commercial opportunities that the 100th anniversary will bring. The In Flanders Fields Museum has been refurbished, increasing its exhibition space by 50%. Local hotels are expanding, 20 new B&Bs have opened. Good morning. Hello, How I'm are you today? Very well, thank you. Oh, gloves off. <laughs> and tour operators like Carl Erg are anticipating a major boost. What we have seen over the last year is a steady increase of visitors. For a very long time, it was World War II that overshadowed the First World War. And now it is, it's getting the attention that it really deserves. Here is a typical souvenir shop, where you can see all the, the cups, the, the cats, ashtrays with poppies, gin. For some, however, the idea of making a commercial enterprise based on such a tragic event is disrespectful. It's amazing what people come up with. Suddenly we see an, 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 
an overload of poppy products and souvenir products that to me is a little bit over the top. But some local shopkeepers believe selling these products can be an act of charity. We sell the poppies uh, because it's a soft feeling of caramel and chocolate and we do it especially because it's uh, uh, a part of this goes to charity. So that's a strong symbol and we like to keep it very respectful. The question is, can this town capitalise on the opportunities the anniversary brings without selling out its important commemorative role? One group believes they've struck this delicate balance. Dressing in First World War uniforms, Jan Vadut and his group guide tourists around sites of key battles in the area. People nowadays, they don't know uh, how was a soldier dressed in that way. There are a lot of myths about soldiers, especially young kids come here and want to play Rambo. Then we can show them, no, it was like that. This is his backpack. This is the way he had to cook here, to feed, to clean his rifle. The centenary offers a great chance for education, but the line between remembering and exploiting remains blurred. Still, it turns out, this is nothing new. In 1917, you know Michelin, they already uh, printed a guide of the battlefields. So it's, it's existing as long as the war is existing. Well, if you're thinking of coming to Belgium or France to mark the anniversary, here are some travel tips. Tip one, if you're hoping to trace a relative who took part in the Great War, then do some homework before you go. A good starting place is the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, which holds the most comprehensive record of war dead. As well as helping you locate the grave, sites like this can sometimes reveal new details about the individual. Tip two, if you're in Belgium in July and you're a sporting fan, then head to Ypres. Stage five of the Tour de France will start in the city for the first time to commemorate the centenary before finishing back in France. Tip three, before making the trip to France or Belgium, see if there are any events happening closer to home. If you're based in the UK, for example, check out the Imperial War Museum in London, which reopens in July after six months of renovations with new First World War galleries. Another bonus, entrance is free. Still to come. It's got to be one of the natural wonders of the world to see that those stalactites, stalactites there have been there millions of years. We explore this eerie, cavernous world off the coast of Mexico. But first, this week's travel update. Greece is anticipating a record arrival of tourists for the second year running, with revenues expected to reach 13 billion euros. Income from visitors in 2013 helped the country, which has been ravaged by recession, post its first surplus since it began keeping data in 1940. Brazilian authorities have asked sports giant Adidas to stop selling controversial T-shirts ahead of this year's World Cup for fears they promote sexual tourism. One of the shirts read, looking to score, next to a scantily clad woman. Brazil has said it's trying to distance itself from the sexual stereotypes that have marked the country for decades. The Burmese government has announced plans to repair the country's longest teak wood bridge. Mandalay's Ubain Bridge, which is over 100 years old, sees heavy foot traffic daily, and the government believes replacing the rotting wooden pillars with concrete ones would give the bridge more longevity. Archaeologists and historians have said the Teak Bridge is a major part of the country's heritage. After weeks on the road, we finally made it to Rome. A place where food, drink and taking it easy are top priorities. The Italians seem to have life all figured out. Yeah. Ciao. Hey. Prendo pizza bianco, per favore. Yeah. Ah, grazie.
that's it. My new favorite after dinner drink. to come on The Travel Show. Find out how the award-winning War Horse was adapted for the German stage. So see you after the break. Welcome back to uh, not so sunny Belgium and the travel show, your essential guide wherever you're heading. They're called cenotes, once living coral reefs, now underground labyrinths of limestone eroded over millions of years creating a stunning subterranean wonder of stalactites and stalagmites. Mexico's is the largest underwater cave system anywhere in the world. These cenotes form part of the very fabric of the Yucatan Peninsula, extraordinary water-filled caverns that continue to give up the secrets of Mexico's ancient history, as well as providing an exciting and growing form of tourism. Divers kit up a short distance from the cenotes. Carefully walking down this way, okay? Don't put the things on in here because it's more effort and you hold people behind you. So you For safety reasons, guides are required to have full cave diving qualifications, even though we'll only be diving the larger, less restricted caverns. Dive guides lead the way through a series of openings, gradually dropping deeper into the cenotes, always following the orange guide ropes to avoid getting lost. In some areas, the crystal clear fresh water meets the more dense salt water penetrating from the sea, creating a blurry halocline, making everything look eerily out of focus. This is as far as recreational divers are allowed to go. Beyond this point, the cave systems, which can go on for miles, are far too dangerous. Returning through the wider openings, the stalactites and stalagmites, 
some of the largest submerged formations in the world give the cenotes a cathedral-like quality. Not surprisingly, visitors are left with a sense of wonderment. It's got to be one of the natural wonders of the world to see that those stalagmites, stalactites there have been you know, millions of years and they're just frozen in time. Oh, it's beautiful, uh, it's gorgeous. It's, it's ne I've never seen anything like it ever. In recent years, the cenotes have become a major draw for tourists as well as cave divers and scientists. This in turn has led to more and more discoveries about the unique history of the peninsula and its people. Carmen Rojas is an underwater archaeologist who specializes in the cenotes. Among her discoveries in the caves around Tulum are a human skull, one of many from the ancient Mayan civilization, a people who regarded the cenotes as a sacred underworld. Other extraordinary finds include the skeleton of a boy, believed to be more than 10,000 years old, one of the oldest found in the Americas, artifacts which make the cave systems an important national treasure. We are trying to tell to the rest of the world no, why we should protect this, not only because it's beautiful and we love to vacation it in here, but because it contains a lot of history and moreover, modern history. We are like a lab in the present in this area. It's reckoned there could be between five and 7,000 of these cave systems. No one knows for sure. New ones are being discovered all the time, but there does now seem to be a stronger desire to put in place better protection for these archaeological jewels of the Yucatan Peninsula. Next up, let's head to Berlin, which in the past 20 years has gone from being a divided city to a reunited capital, home to a vibrant contemporary art scene and one of Europe's most prestigious film festivals. But it's a groundbreaking theatrical event focusing on the First World War that's been making headlines recently. The travel show had an exclusive backstage pass. I'm Silke. I'm playing in this theatre right next to us, in the Theater des Westens, the German version of War Horse, and as we call it, Gefährten. It's a story in the First World War, so you can see the German and English soldiers fighting against each other. And with this horse as an innocent creature going through this war, this is really special. And to make a theater like that, like an, we call it event theater, with this subject, this has never happened before. When I saw it in London, I really, I didn't really get what this means for Germans. Now, as I'm here in Berlin playing this play, every day it's really something very, very special to me. It is time now, after 100 years, that we, we go back in history and look where, where the wars began and where these in, industrially um, machines started in the war that really make it so cruel, because before the First World War it, it never had so, so much soldiers dead. So and these are my costumes, because I'm not only playing Rose, 
Um, I'm also playing three different soldiers, a German soldier and two British soldiers. This is also me. This is, uh, we call it the burned wounded. A lot of thought has gone into um, how people would react, how people would uh, see things, and trying to be very, very uh, mindful of what it means to bring an anti-war story into a country that has um, a particular history. The interesting thing about this, this part for me is that usually in, in the TV, in the cinema, we Germans are used to see a German guy related to the war as a really bad guy. And it was very clever that they changed my part of Clausen here so he, he polarizes the public. He gives two, he has two faces. He has the, the bad face, really, but he also helps other guys in the, in the war. It, it surprises to see it in another way. <laughs> Okay, it's now about five minutes before the show, and uh, I have to get backstage. Bye. People watching this show are, seem to be very moved. Um, I've seen a a man sitting in the first row and he was about 80 so he has the experience of a world war and he was um, he was crying <laughs> I mean even to me this is <sighs> this is my father's about 83 now and this drama of of this, this trauma of these world wars is so with us, with me, and people can feel that. behind the scenes of the German production of War Horse, which is booking between now and September in Berlin. Well, that's it from us in Belgium. Thanks so much for joining us. And here's where we're off to next week. Join us next week when Henry meets a survival expert in Thailand to get tips on how to get through a night alone and lost in the jungle. You just have to psych yourself into thinking this is okay. I'm just camping with not a lot of kit. <laughs> so do join us if you can and in the meantime don't forget you can keep up with us while we're on the road in real time if you follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Well for now from me Crystal Arwood and all of the team here in Belgium including my broken brolly it's goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>